Hello and welcome to Sir Thriver Unleashed. I'm Reno Romano, your host and a Sir Thriver and advocate for survivors of child sexual abuse and sexual assault. This show is all about the endless positive possibilities of Sir Thriving after sexual abuse. So let's get started with today's program. Welcome to the show. This show is all about the endless positive possibilities of Sir Thriving After Sexual Abuse. My guest today is Kat Deusterhouse, a media professional, organizer, and advocate, a member of Reigns Speaker Bureau, a member of Florida Now in the Violence Task Force, also on the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence and in three different counties of the sexual assault response teams, a sur thriver of rape, domestic violence, and stalking. Welcome to the show, Kat. Thank you so much, Rena. Rena, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm excited to, to have you here. I want to tell everybody up front, I met Kat. Was it um, in 2019, I believe? 2000, I know it was before 20, 2020. But I think it was 2018. Yeah. October of 2018, 2018 I believe. It yeah. could have been. We are both members of the Reigns Speaker Bureau, and that's how we met. They're, they had an event for their speakers in Florida, and we all went to an event in Orlando, and that's where we met. And we've been advocating and doing all sorts of fun stuff to empower survivors to take back their life. So welcome, Kat. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you here. And thank you for agreeing to come on the show because I just think you are an awesome person. You're doing so much in the state of Florida. And I'm, I couldn't be more proud of you. Thank you, Rena. And I really love what you're doing, creating this movement of survivors. So I'm 100% here for that. I'm very excited to be on the show today. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kat. So you are a survivor of rape, domestic violence, and stalking. And I know it's um, it's difficult to go through those things. Can you can you share with us, you know, what were some of the struggles maybe that you faced in the aftermath of being assaulted? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that I went the whole gamut, um, uh, from denial to just deep, deep, dark depression. And at even at, at one point, even, you know, losing and struggling with the will to live. Um, I went to, you know, the opposite end, um, trying to re-roll with hypersexuality. Um, I've had moments of PTSD where, um, you know, I'm dissociating even still to this day if the right combination of triggers come up in my daily life. Um, so I've basically gone the gamut from, um, you know, it's, it, it's a loss. Trauma, experiencing trauma is a loss. So we go through these stages, much like the stages of grief. And I, I want to say I, I've, I've hit all of them, anger even too. So in the aftermath, you know, it was a big whirlwind as I worked through these emotions and, and kind of like a long uh, cyclical um, experience because they keep coming up too. Even when, you know, you've done some healing work um, and you've moved through one of the sets of emotions, sometimes they circle back around. Uh, maybe there wasn't something that was a hundred percent examined and broken apart again and, and felt and, and re-experienced and recontextualized. Um, so really, I think the biggest struggle for me, though, was the depression. Um, and after being sexually assaulted, um, losing the will to live, that was definitely the most terrifying and difficult uh, part of the of those aftermath emotions to go through and regaining, you know, the will to live was I think for me, the biggest obstacle, but, um, you know, I'm still here. I've made it and I've moved through these all to, I would say, successfully sur thrive. So that doesn't mean that it's a hundred percent for me still. So the aftermath continues, but I've got a, a, a much better grasp on it than, than I initially had many years ago. You know, and I'm glad that you brought that up because I turned 65 years young just the <gasps> other day. I know. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. 
I still have aftermath of the things that I went through. So I want I want survivors to understand that it can continue, but not as severely. I understand when I'm being triggered and I understand what is PTSD and I acknowledge it and I affirm it and then I work through it. Uh, that's how we take back our power. Would you agree with that? I would 100% agree with that. Um, I did many years of therapy. So I've got this toolkit that I can access anytime that these triggers do come up. So yeah, they definitely still do come up, but thankfully I'm able to navigate them with a, a lot more sure footing now that I've got the skills and I've done the work to get there. Good. Good for you. I'm I'm glad you are. And I'm glad you're here because you're doing so much work out in the state of Florida and helping survivors and advocating. When did you decide to get help for your assault? How long it after was, after? It was take? four years after. And um, I was actually in a sexual education class at a community college in Orange County, California. We had various speakers come through in this class. And one day we had a survivor of sexual assault. And she bravely shared her story. A light bulb kind of went off in my head. And I was just like, oh, my God, mm. that's what happened to me. And, and there were similarities in her story, not in the, in, the, uh, in the events that happened, but in the reaction. And uh, she shared dissociating during the assault. And that was really the big light bulb uh, switch for me because my reaction was the same, too. And that was a part of my whole cycle of blame uh, that I dissociated and kind of left my body, um, which you know, there, therefore left me much more, uh, I would say, much more. I thought I think that uh, the predator probably really like predators probably really liked that, um, that I was dissociated. And that was a source of blame for me. So when I heard the survivor come and speak and the light bulb went off. I was like, you know what, like, this is, this is something that is serious and I need to go get some help for. It. So mm -hmm. I, I opened up to the teacher, to the professor. And I said, look, I realized after today's talk that I've been through something similar and what do I do basically? And she was actually a therapist herself also. And she recommended somebody to me. So I, I started therapy four years after the assault. Yeah. And there's no time limit. I know that um, after my assault, it wasn't for another 10 years or so that I got help. I think I think because of the Me Too movement and it's um, coming out of the closet, per se, about sexual assault. And there's we're seeing more people that it's affecting that people are getting help a lot sooner, which is a good thing. Uh, the really good thing will be when it stops. But. Um, to let people know, because back when I was assaulted, not uh, just a couple of months before, a friend of mine had been raped. And this was, you know, 30 years ago. They blamed her. Well, what were you wearing? Blah, blah, blah. And I know that that still happens today. Did you have any anything like that? Did you have any backlash of anything similar to that when you came out? I know it's getting better, but tell me about your experience, if you would. Yeah, I definitely um, experienced victim blaming. Um, shortly after being assaulted, I did tell somebody that something happened, although I, I don't believe I used the word rape. I think I just said that, you know, this was a sexual experience that I didn't want to and they wouldn't let me leave. And the person that I shared was like, well, you know, what did you expect going to that party dress? Lot, basically. And, um, you know, I think that that um, led to me repressing what happened and kind of even further repackaging it in my brain. And, and, and that's why I think that light bulb moment four years later was so important to me. Um, that also led to an additional instance of victim blaming, though, because when I went to report it to the police, um, their interrogation of me after was very ignorant and very blaming. Um, I got asked questions like, you know, uh, why didn't you fight harder? And did you actually say the word no? Um, why didn't you scream for help? 
And, you know, obviously they weren't educated in the neurobiology of trauma. So they didn't quite understand that when my defense circuitry triggered on, I lost my executive thinking. I lost my ability to, you know, think logically and three steps ahead and my body froze up and, and, and I didn't have exact control over it. And my memory was encoding differently. So obviously, you know, these, this was uh, the victim blaming I experienced at the law enforcement, I believe, wasn't because they were bad people. I believe it was because they were extremely ignorant. And that's something that's, you know, culturally relevant, not just that individual law enforcement officer. It's taken us a while as a culture to have the science to back up some of these experiences to say, well, this is why this happens. Um, you know, this is why survivors reacted to their assaults in a certain way. And, you know, these reactions that sometimes have been used to um, point blame at a survivor are actually indicative of trauma, are actually indicative of how our brain responds when we're encountering something that we feel is like threatening at the time. So yes, a lot of victim blame I experienced in the aftermath as well. I'm sorry to hear that. And I know it's getting better. And I don't want to scare if you haven't, if you're listening in or watching this, if you haven't asked for help yet, don't make the assumption that you will get go through the victim blaming. Because I think the more of us coming out and we're educating the police, the police are and the first responders are being trained now a lot better. But I think, you know, we can sort of feel out who we can tell and who we can't. You know, I did a TEDx talk. It's called Healing from Sexual Abuse Can Start With One Word. I encourage everyone, survivors, victims, family and friends to watch it because it's got some good information on how to approach survivors. I really appreciate you sharing that. But again, because you and I are advocating and we are doing training and you being in three different counties in Florida on the sexual assault response team, we are getting involved and doing a lot of work. I really appreciate that. Um, How long after you went through therapy, did you start getting involved in the advocacy work? Um, I want to say it was um, over 10 years. There was definitely, um, you know, a quite a long delay between, you know, the healing process and my my readiness to become a public speaker about being assaulted. And yeah, when I first reported to the police, that was like 17 years ago. So, you know, the our culture has come quite a long way. Law enforcement has come a long way. They've uh, begin uh, they've begun to be trauma informed. There's a great campaign called Start by Believing that's helping to educate our law enforcement officers. So it's a very different time now. And um, even from when I went into therapy, that was uh, when I had just started art school. That is so great to know. And, um, you know, you waited 10 years. And and what I want other survivors to know, you don't have to get involved in advocacy work. You you can you must share your story. And, And I think it's to get help, find the right therapist. And with me, I went through through two therapists before I found the right one. And it's your life. If you're not comfortable with the therapist, keep searching because there's someone out there that you can communicate with and you'll feel comfortable with. What I do want to say is, you know, so let me ask you this, Kat, do you think doing the advocacy work and sharing your your story uh, does it help with the healing process? Does it give you more fuel for the fire, per se? Yeah, I think that becoming active in the public space, telling my story to others, um, getting involved with some of the local organizations that deal with sexual violence has been an essential part of my healing. Um, you know, it took a lot of groundwork to get here. It's been a way for me to own what's happened, to reintegrate integrate it into my life story in a way that's positive. So, you know, as much as it was a negative uh, experience uh, and, and a and to be dealt, I've really kind of used it uh, best potential. i uh, flipped it around, if you might say, into a positive in my life even. I know that's kind of a weird thing to say about it, but there is good that is coming out of this experience. And, and I think it's given me a great sense of fulfillment that, you know, it didn't happen for nothing. Uh, it happened to me and I was able to survive it. 
and I'm taking it now and I'm using it to help and lift others up. And, and that's, I think, was an essential part of my switch from survivor to survivor. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. I, and you know, what I want to tell the listeners, you don't have to get involved with the ad- advocacy work. You know, a lot of people aren't comfortable with that and being a, a public figure or whatever. And that's cool. You know, just becoming your best version of yourself possible after trauma is awesome. And that to me is um, paying it forward because if if your children see, if your children, your family, they see how you can work through it and become the best possible version of yourself, you give them hope, especially, you know, because we have a lot of friends and family that have been incest survivors or rape survivors, but they haven't shared that with people. So if, if we do share, I think it gives people more permission to come out and heal and we need to heal. I think it's so important. Well, I am so proud of you. And I want to share with the listeners, Kat and I discussed this before we started because I was having to retake her uh, introduction and about, uh, and I just said her, (laughs) (laughs) and that's where I'm going next because Kat you go by them or they you don't identify as her or she I identify as her or she and it's hard for me to say they or them but I applaud you on that And can you just explain a little bit about that? And please forgive me for saying she or her. It's it's something that I'm working on. It's it's something that I'm I'm newly public about as well. Um, So I came out as non-binary about a year ago. And that just means that, you know, I I don't identify as a man or a woman. Um, You know, I I can be a little bit more gender fluid where I have my femme moments or my masculine moments. Uh, So them or they kind of is just the natural fit for that. It's a bit more neutral and kind of encompasses who I am a little bit better than she, her. But I'm not offended by she, her, but I am also practicing myself um, requesting that people use the pronouns that I prefer. I got it. I got it. So them thank you. I, I appreciate it. No, I, yeah. I get it. And uh, I think with our younger generation, they're more comfortable with that and being non-binary. I am. I can be very masculine. I had a friend, a um, very good friend years ago, and I bought a brand new blue Mustang that had a stick shift. He awesome. was he was gay <laughs> and he got into my car and said, oh, Rena, that's so butch. <laughs> I'm like, so what's wrong with that? You know, so I get it because I have, I, we all have those masculine and feminine traits. And I think we should embrace whatever we feel comfortable with. So thank you for allowing us to talk about that because there are a lot more people that are coming out of the closet per se with that. And I think we should, Mm -hmm. just like we're coming out about our sexual assault, our incest, we need to have these conversations. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, definitely. And I think that the more, you know, we we get used to people speaking their truth and being supportive of it, the more people can be themselves. And, and, you know, that's the only way to, (laughs) that's the only game in town. When you feel safe enough to be yourself around people, that also too is a huge sign of healing and trauma can kind of make us put ourselves into a box um, because that's safe and, and it can be scary right after trauma. So I think that also it's a sign of my healing that I'm able to say, Hey, this is what I prefer. And to have supportive friends that, you know, are, are willing to, to, to mess up on the pronouns, but talk about it and uh, keep trying, you know, that, that then reinforces that I am safe to come out. You know, I am safe to be myself. And and, and I don't want to say that they are, they're always safe spaces, right. um, but, but I look at them like, you know what, this can be a brave space where I can be brave because I know that I'm strong. I know that I'm a survivor and it may not go exactly like I want to, but I know that I've got the ability to handle a lot. 
So um, I, I I essentially feel like, you know, I'm pretty strong now. And so surviving has has also helped to give me that confidence in my strength that I can survive just about anything. Good for you. You are a true Sir Thriver. And that's the part of the definition of Sir Thriver. The definition that I made for it is, is releasing the shame of what has happened to us. Instead of focusing on the crime, to focus on our courage, strength, and tenacity to persevere during and after what has happened to us and to live in our truth and not be ashamed of it. So bravo to you, Kat. And uh, thanks for your patience on. And what I really want to say too is thanks for not being offended if I say she or her, because I, I think by being offended and being gentle with people and, and educating them, I think is going to help more. I ha- I know someone and I I get being stuck in the anger because I was stuck in anger for so long. Anger can be a catalyst for change, but it's not a good place to stay. Yeah, I think it says a lot to do with um, somebody's sense of safety. When, when we're able to move past that point of, of defensiveness, I think it says a lot about how safe we, we feel in a space. So, um, you know, I really, I'm, I really appreciate just the ability to, to, to feel this good and, and to have great people around me that are so supportive and to be able to, you know, be really relaxed and not be defensive. That's a good feeling. It's a really good feeling. I, I know that I'm safe and, and, and I appreciate that. Yay. Well, we want it. We we're trying to create safe space here. Well, I know what it yeah. feels like where we need to feel safe. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I am so proud of you and all the work that you're doing. And thanks for letting me share that and talk about that as well, because I'm so proud of you. You're such a strong person. One thing I want to ask you, what is the upside to coming out with that being uh, non-binary? Did I say that correctly? I hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. And being non-binary. And then uh, what's the upside of sharing your truth too with your rape and domestic violence? So if you could share all of that, what's the upside to all of it? Because I believe there's an upside to everything. And you said something a while back that it's kind of weird, but I want people to know I'm proud of everything I've gone through because it's made me the, the person I am today. And so I'm not ashamed. I really appreciate you talking about being non-binary and sharing your your story of rape rape and domestic violence. What I like to say that there's always an upside to everything. And I know you said earlier, it might seem kind of weird, but there is an upside to everything. So tell me, tell, tell us about the upside of everything that you're experienced through all of that. If you would, I think, um, you know, standing in my truth, living in my truth is, um, it, you know, there's so many different multiple benefits to this. It's, you know, constantly reinforcing to myself that there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's helping others click that light bulb in their brain where they can start the healing process. And, that, you know, having it come full circle, being able to witness that is amazing. And then um, the positive is that change that comes out of it. You know, we do have a lot of work to do in shifting a culture from a rape culture to a culture of consent. And this is, you know, this experience has allowed me to help that. Um, so I, I do it and I live it in the truth uh, for the change that's cultural and for the change in, in other individuals and for the change in myself. That's wonderful, Kat. And I believe the more that we're able to stand in our truth. It's not like we have to go out and announce it to the world. I'm a Sir Thriver of incest or I'm a Sir Thriver of rape. We need to share our story with someone to get help, get healed, get happy. To stand in our truth and to be authentic in our truth, I think encourages others to come forward to get help, get healed, get happy. I, I'm hearing from survivors all over the world who have watched my TEDx talk and they say, thank you because of your talk. I, I started counseling, you know, by you doing the work that you're doing, you're giving people permission to live in their truth too. So bravo, you thank know, you. so congratulations. Thank I just you, think Rena. that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's 
what it's all about. It's all about uh, increasing the light bulbs, increasing the light and the love. So because of that, are you happy now, Kat? I honestly can say that I am happy. I am fulfilled. Um, and I'm, I've integrated everything that's happened into my life. So it's not uh, shoved down in a box anymore, this thing that I'm ashamed of. It's something that I've taken out and looked at and said, look, you know, this is here. And a lot of other people, it's there for it too. Too many of us. And then, you know, standing up and be able to, being able to do something, I, I do feel happy and it, and it doesn't rule my life 24 seven. You know, I'm, I'm able to have relationships and, and fun experiences, um, but it's there when I need it um, as a catalyst for change and also as a source of strength for me, because I know what I've overcome. I know how strong. So yes, I am happy. And, and I, I, again, just want to remind everybody like you're doing, you know, with your entire mission is that it's possible. It is possible to, to survive sexual assault and, and be happy again, to be, be a survivor, not just a survivor. Yay. Good for you. It's absolutely true. And I know, and we talked about it earlier, we do have those moments and I do too. We're human. It's okay. We're Mm -hmm. going to have those moments where we're triggered or we don't have the confidence or we don't feel good enough. And I, I go through those stages too. It's human. And I found that people who have not gone through the trauma that you and I have struggle with self-esteem and self-confidence. I was in a mastermind not long ago, and this this gentleman was in this that I've looked up to for years. And he said that he struggled with imposter syndrome. So it's not and he hadn't had the trauma that we've gone through. So I want survivors to know it's okay to feel what you're feeling, affirm it, acknowledge it. And get help if you need to, because I've continued to get help through the years, even after counseling. So here's my question for you, Kat. When you find yourself going down that negative road, what do you do to keep yourself um, to get back into that positive mode? What are some of the things that you could share with the listeners that you do? I'm definitely a fan of mindful meditation and body movement. So whenever I get triggered, um, one thing that happens for me is I begin to disconnect from my body a little bit. So some mindful meditation, some movement, some intentional movement, uh, like yoga is, is great for that running or swimming, um, things that are rhythmic, uh, are my favorite. Um, and just getting back in touch with my body and bringing my mind to the here and now with mindfulness. That for me is just the quickest way to get, get out of a trigger. It's like, um, the, when I first notice it, I, I can do a little quick exercise too, where I'm like, okay, what can I hear? What can I see? What can I smell? What can I taste? What can I touch? And, and those five senses, senses, just becoming aware of those things will help ground me into the here and now, because a trigger is my mind being brought back to the path of the trauma but that's not happening anymore. So uh, for me being grounded in the here and now, either through that quick exercise, body movement or mindful meditation, that's um, my biggest secret that I found. That's fantastic. Well, this is great, Kat. Thank you for sharing all of your uh, experiences and and how you've gone through them and what you do to stay positive now. What what are you working on now? What's going on with Kat? cat these days? What's what's happening? Well, this year I'm um, still continuing my activism in the Florida legislature and we are advocating for Gale's Law, which would implement a rape kit tracking system in Florida. And that is one great way to give survivors back a little bit of control in the aftermath of uh, sexual assault when they're going through that legal process. Um, you know, not everybody wants to get a sexual assault exam and that's totally fine. But for those who do uh, choose to do that, they should have the ability to, to find out if they want to where their rape kit is in processing. So uh, this will help give them that control and also make sure that our law enforcement and hospitals and processing centers are all keeping track of that and doing it in a timely manner, which can help us um, ensure our rights to do process. That's wonderful. And I want the listeners to know that Kat gave me a copy of her letter that she sent to Tallahassee 
And so I was able to write my letter. I I saw how she did it because she's really involved in doing advocacy work a lot more than, than I am. So thank you for that. Thank you for your help. Gail's law, it went through the Senate, right? Tell us a little bit about yes. that. It passed the first process. Yeah. So it just yesterday had its first hearing in the Senate Criminal Justice Committee and it moved forward. So it's going on the committee. It had seven yes votes and only one no. So, I mean, it's that that was a really good percentage. (laughs) But that blows my mind that there's ever a one no. You know, when we were uh, giving our testimony for Donna's law in Tallahassee, when I was there, they all voted yes. And and I would, I would have been surprised. One no, I I can't believe it. Donna's law did great. Uh, We had unanimous support the entire way through. Not a single legislator in Florida voted against removing the time limits for prosecuting sexual assault of a minor. Um, But this one, I think because there's a bit of a fiscal cost, I think maybe some of the more fiscally conservative ones um, have expressed some concerns for it. Um, though there is federal dollars set aside for this and 27 other states have already approved um, and maybe are in the process if they haven't just yet implemented a rape kit system. So, you know, this is part of the national best practice to backlog um, and in handling sexual assault cases. So, you know, it's kind of a no brainer, um, but I think some people are just a little bit more concerned about the dollar amount um, I gotcha. than others. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I'm just always floored when there's a no there. So that makes sense. So I right. want to tell it's the a survi- nonpartisan issue. Yeah, it, it really you know? is. It's a nonpartisan yeah. issue. So I want to tell this, the listeners that rain R A I N N is the rape and incest national network. And Kat and I are on the speakers bureau. If you're a survivor, if you're looking to get involved, contact rain if you haven't gotten help and you you don't know where to turn, contact Rain Rain.org, R-A-I-N-N, and they have a toll-free number that you can call too. So, Kat, well, I could talk with you forever. I love seeing your, your beautiful face again. I, I love all the work that you're doing. Thank you for helping me with Kat. You and I also filmed a documentary together it was involving Donna's Law. Have you heard anything more on that? Yeah, it was really, it was really cool. We have a uh, female award-winning fil- filmmaker who uh, interviewed us all and is putting together, I think, a docu series about our involvement with Donna's Law and helping to to get that unanimous uh, passing of it here in Florida. So I can't wait to see it. I haven't seen the uh, the final cuts, but. Uh, that hopefully will be coming out soon. And, and I hope it will inspire other survivors in other states to get involved with their legislative process and removing a statute of limitations or, um, you know, rape kit tracking. There's there's a lot of legal reform that still needs to be done to catch up um, our society with all these, uh, you know, scientific understandings that we've had and these cultural awakenings such as the Me Too movement. So right. I think we're... we're we're, we're starting to understand um, sexual assault survivor needs a lot more. We're starting to believe us a lot more, which is great. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, healing going on, but we just, we still need our justice system to catch up there. We sure do. We sure do. Kat, it's been so much fun to have you here. Where can people find out more about Kat if they want to get in touch with you? Where can they go? So I'm on all social media as the cat talk, um, but cat is with a K. So I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can just do the at symbol, the cat with a K talk, the cat talk. Awesome. Well, I've had so much fun with you. Thanks for agreeing to be on this show. And to our listeners, if you want to reach out to Kat, see how she's gotten involved with the advocacy work, see what she's doing, follow her on Facebook. I'll have the link under here and in the show notes. If you want to get involved, they, 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 thank you. (laughs) If you want to reach out to they, right? 
or them, they or them. Or yeah, them. Either one works. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm still learning, but that's okay. No, that's okay. Perfectly okay. Thank you that's, for trying again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But if you want to reach out to Kat, check her out on Facebook and all the other social media. I'll have it posted in the show notes. Also, if you haven't gotten help, get help, get healed, get happy, reach out to your local crisis center or brain on the internet. Kat, thanks again for being here today. I love seeing yeah. you. Thank you so much for inviting me on, Rena. I, I absolutely love what you're doing. Thank you. It's, it's a great service for, for survivors, um, helping us move along to sur- thriving. Thank you. Yeah, let's show them the positive possibilities of life after trauma. So, yes, yes. We're strong. We are yes. strong. Woo-hoo. <laughs> so thanks for being here. And until next time, Sir Thriver, I wish you peace, love, and ciao for now. <laughs>